the handouts include uh, some tips from the Thompsons and more tips from the Thompsons. And, and these are actually true things that happened either to my brothers and I or my sons or my grandsons. And there's some practical tips there for you. We won't take time to go over them now, but uh, it's important things like making sure you look into um, things like washing machines, dryers, and ovens before you turn them on to make sure there is not a stuffed animal or a real animal or a baby brother. <laughs> There's also a list of life lessons from Raising Boys by a guy named Harry Harrison Jr., who's a New York Times bestseller author, He's written a lot of uh, parenting books. And these are, again, some practical things that you can look at um, at your leisure. But again, there are practical things like remind your son often to put the seat up then to put the seat down, then to flush. And teach him to throw up in the toilet, not in your bed. And some sports one, keep in mind that if his soccer or baseball or basketball team is more important to you, Dad, than it is to him, something is wrong with you. If this coach is a screamer, find another team. If you are the coach, retire. <laughs> also included is a handout by Christina Summers, uh, based upon her book, More on Boys. And she details about some of the things that are happening uh, in the education system with the boys, and again, uh, I won't go through them all, but she tells about some stories about how uh, typical boys will write a story and uh, get into trouble, or because of some zero tolerance policy, uh, get into trouble. Uh, I know Dan had experience with that with one of his uh, sons. Um, pointing his finger and getting in trouble. And she talks about the uh, uh, elimination of recess and, and a whole bunch of games that get rid of energy by boys and that have been eliminated. have a, uh, a picture there in the back of uh, one of the handouts of our family when we had just the three boys. Uh, Dan is the little one in that picture. There's a couple more handouts up here. People want to get them. That's the only ones there are. There's a one. There's three more up here. And that picture, Dan, is the little one I'm reading to. You can see because he'll be up in front of you in a minute. That he's changed quite a bit. I, however, have not. <laughs> by Ben Shapiro commenting on how uh, <coughs> the idea of bravery has changed over the years in that referring to uh, our president's 
failure to uh, the only president since D-Day to recognize D-Day on its anniversary. But he did send out a message to all the transgender youth for being so brave and that he wanted to make sure that they knew that the president had their back. So the definition of bravery uh, has changed, or at least in some minds, the definition of bravery has changed. Dan is now going to talk a little bit about that and how uh, installation of courage and things like that, virtues like that, into our sons is uh, something that we want to strive for. Uh, Dan grew up in this church. Uh, he's, he is a patent attorney living in Akron. He gave a message here last time in 2012. At that time, he had five boys. And since then, he's doubled his brood. He, he now has eight boys and two girls. Dan? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, anybody ever heard of the book Raising a Modern Day Night? Robert Lewis. Yeah, so this is that's where this title comes from. Um, I read the book about oh, 16 years ago. Well, apparently, it was on. Oh, we are. Um, and it really changed a lot about how I saw things. Uh, most of the time, those types of books I, I find them to be not always helpful, or you know, I don't know. But this one really hit me because it talked about the intentionality of raising children. I thought that was really crucial. Um, and so I'm not a pediatrician. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a child psychologist. Um, so my credentials are this. <laughs> I have eight sons. Um, my oldest one is 23. Uh, my youngest one is six. And we also have two daughters, uh, nine and five. And I was just thinking the other day, we were going to grad parties, that by the time my youngest daughter graduates from high school, my wife and I will have been raising children for 37 years. Um, seems kind of hard to believe, but as somebody told me one time, I thought really crystallized it, because if you have children, I am sure that you have people older than you come to you going, oh, it's okay, time flies. And someday you'll look back at this and think, when they're 18, wow, this was great, and you're in the midst of your kid puking on you. Okay. And you smile, but you really want to punch them, because that's not helpful. But I did hear one that actually really was helpful. What they said was, the days are long, the years are short. Like, that's actually it. That explains it perfectly. So, as, you know, as each day goes by, it seems to drag forever. Um, but I do remember when my oldest son was nine years old, but it really hit me because nine is half of 18 and 18 is kind of done. And I thought, I don't, I don't feel half done raising him. <laughs> you know, something, something's got to, you know, we got to speed this up a little bit. So um, we started this group raising a Monday night at uh, my church when my oldest boy was five. He's now 23, so 18 years. We've been having an annual father-son camping trip, and we go through these, the book and some of the things he teaches. And so I'm going to kind of go through some of those things, starting with um, the four things a man does. And so that's what we go through with our boys, and as the ceremonies continue, we'll talk about those in a little bit. The four things a man does, and the handout you have is something I put together that has a lot of has the modern day night stuff on it. So we have the four things a man does, and the three additional things, then the four ceremonies. Um, reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously, and expect a greater reward. So the first one is reject passivity. Uh, Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we need to teach our boys what the right thing is to do regardless of the consequences. 
Sometimes the right thing to do is to stand in the way of a guy bigger than you. And sometimes that happens. Um, the one in white is my son. <laughs> uh, he, de he decided that he would take on the number 51, who really is as big as he looks in that picture. <laughs> but he has, um, throughout his life, uh, rejecting passivity was not one of his problems. Uh, he was always willing to stand up um, to do the right thing. And I think it's important to teach them that. And not only teach them that, but understand sometimes that's the result. You know, sometimes you're going to get bowled over. Um, and actually, there's a video of that that's even better because he actually got launched. <laughs> he left his feet and flew about six or seven feet. And then after the game, what I was talking about to him, his response was, that was awesome. <laughs> So, you know, it's, we cannot sit back and let evil happen, and that's the first key tenet is rejecting passivity, understanding that we have to do the right thing, even if sometimes it's hard. The next one is accept responsibility. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 14 says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you be done in love. Anybody have teenage drivers? Okay. Um, sometimes it ends up like that. So we got a call at 2 o'clock in the morning, and the conversation was I was asleep. So my wife picked up the phone uh, because I, when I'm asleep, I'm asleep. Um, and the conversation started with, Mom, I'm okay, but, and this was the but. So what had happened is he had allowed one of his friends to drive my car. Uh, here's a, another picture of that. And his friend had decided that it would be fun to drive slightly over the speed limit. And he took a turn going 35, he says lost control of the car, spun out, hit a tree, and flipped the car over. Now, he was not going 35. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this incident had been after he had let one of his friends drive my car and poked a hole in the catalytic converter, which I noticed because he was driving home and suddenly he was driving a tractor. And I said, what happened to my car? And he said, that's a really cool sound, isn't it? No, it's not. <laughs> what happened to my car? His friend had driven over a rock, poked a hole in my catalytic converter, which then pre precipitated me to say, your friends are not allowed to drive my car. So, end of story, clearly. Except for this. And I said, didn't I tell you that your friends weren't allowed to drive my car? And he goes, oh. I thought you just meant Jake. Why would I mean just Jake? All of your friends are idiots. <laughs> Why would I mean that? And so the follow-up conversation has to do with accepting responsibility was, well, I mean, you're going to have to handle this. He goes, whoa, what do you mean? It's not my fault. I go, okay, is it my fault? Well, no. We, when I give you my car, who's responsible for it? But he was driving it. It's not what I asked him. Who's responsible for the car when I let you drive it? I am. Right. So therefore, that's your fault. You're responsible for that. They said, well, but he should have said, that's between you and him. Now, if I were you, I would make him pay for it too, because he's the one driving the car. But that's between you and him. So, um, Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Teenage drivers. So this is outside our church. You can see in the background there, the chapel on the river. So my second son, who currently owns three cars, and has owned six cars, and is 21, decided to buy himself a new car. 12 hours later, that happened. So, 
We have to teach boys. Now, as a caveat, many of these things I'm talking about also apply to girls, too. Uh, it's not just boys, but um, if you have teenage drivers and your vehicle ends up like that, I'm, I'm betting 9 out of 10 it's a boy. Just say it. Um, you have to learn how to admit when you do stuff that's wrong. You have to understand that it's not okay to blame other people. Um, that's our culture. Our culture is teaching people it's always somebody else's fault. It's not your fault. It's fill in the blank. Whatever has come before you, it's that. You know, it's your friend's fault. It's your parents' fault. It's society's fault. Whatever. Fill it. I mean, you, can always, you can always think of something to blame other people. And if you think back, um, anybody have children under five? Okay. So, I am sure that you have heard when you ask them, if something happened and who did it, the response is, was it me? <laughs> now, if you only have one child, you know it was them. But if you have more than one child, now it's a little unclear. And guess what they're going to do? It was him. It wasn't me. It was him. And guess what the other one's going to say? Uh-huh. It wasn't me. It was him. All right. Great. Now what do you do? And so this idea is, you know, of accepting responsibility, learning how to be a man understanding that it's it's on you and especially as men especially because the man leads the family you know I, I think that's one of the scariest things about being a husband and a father is that someday you will stand before God and if your family screwed up he's gonna look to you first and your answer better not be well it was my fault you know you can pull the Adam card it was that woman you gave me <laughs> you know it didn't work out so well for Adam but it, we're the first line of defense and you have to teach teach the boys that that's something they need to learn how to do. Is accept blame, accept responsibility when something's on their shoulders. They lead courageously. Is the third one, Joshua twenty four fifteen. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so you have to teach leadership. Leadership, there are some people who kind of have that built into them. They're kind of natural leaders. And you'll, you'll see that. And we've all experienced that with certain people. But leadership is something you can learn. It's not just some, oh, he's a natural born leader. Okay, that's fine. Um, but that doesn't mean people who are not can't also lead. You can teach people how to lead. You can learn how to lead. Um, and then what's really important is understanding what biblical leadership is. And that's where you're going to run into the buzzsaw of culture. Because what the Bible teaches about leading and what the culture teaches about leading are vastly different. And so you're going to have to have great courage if you're going to lead in accordance with what the Bible says. Because the world is going to tell you you're doing it wrong. That's going to be the response. You're doing it wrong. You're screwing up your kids. You're teaching them bad things. My dad mentioned the, my son with the finger. So he was in first grade. His teacher um, was in her 60s, which was hard to imagine that she made it this long because it was very clear after talking to her a couple of times that she had a hard time with young boys. Why are you a first grade teacher if you have a hard time with young boys? Because usually they're responsible. They won't sit in a group in, in, in a little circle. How do you reach them? Right? Because they're boys. Well, the girls sit in a circle, right? mm -hmm. not surprised, but boys don't. Not that they can, of course, but they usually don't. So we get a call. No, no, this was at an actual parent-teacher meeting. She has this concerned look on her face. Really concerned about Kevin. Which, I mean, is legitimate. Because, I mean, you know, he was the one that pulled out in front of somebody two hours about his car. So, and he's done some stuff. So I was like, well, okay, what's coming? Because I get it. He can be a handful of times. She's like, well, you know, he, he used his fingers as a gun in class. <laughs> and? <laughs> you know, and it's just like, well, we don't pretend with guns. Okay? You know, like, I mean, we have people. He was about to use real guns too. I probably should bring that up. <laughs> so, from that point forward, we homeschooled our kids. Uh, we decided 
if this is what the public school wants out of my boy, we are not aligned. And so we decided, pretty sure we can do this better on our own than that. So um, the fourth one is expect the greater reward. Um, some of you probably know the woman in the wheelchair there. That's my, my grandmother, my dad's mom. Um, so this was a picture, um, I'm not sure when this was, shortly after we adopted. Um, so in case any of you don't know, I have six biological boys, and then we adopted four children from Colombia, two boys and two girls. Um, so this was the opportunity we had to have them meet their, their great grandmother. Um, and, and she just epitomized the Christian faith. And so it was, just, it was a neat picture. Glad they got to meet her uh, before she moved on to the final chapter of her life. Uh, Revelation 22.15 says, Blessed are those who, who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. So um, I've also uh, had the privilege of baptizing my four older boys. Um, I, our church allows us to do that. Um, and if you want your boys to grow up to be men of God, which I would hope is your goal, um, one of the things they need to understand is, what is this all about? What is the purpose of life? <laughs> you know, again, that's for boys and girls, of course, but what is the purpose of life? Well, the purpose of life is the eternal reward. I mean, we live here as the precursor to living in heaven forever. I mean, they need to understand that this world is a difficult place. This world is a cursed world, it's a broken world, but there's something better to come. I mean, when we, we live here, we move forward into eternity. So that's why, if you've been to a Christian funeral and been to a non-Christian funeral, there was probably a difference. You probably noticed a drastic difference. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be sad if a Christian dies. Of course you can, because you miss them here. But the but there should be joy interwoven in a Christian feeling. You should see that. You should notice a difference. And this, this greater reward is that's what you're striving for. You're striving for the greater reward to be with God at all times. So the next phase, um, there's three things. So a work to do, a will to obey, and a woman to love. So Colossians 3, 22 and 23, he says, Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord, and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as a reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So, um, actually, there's kind of a neat story behind that. Um, this picture is, um, oh, I get it. Sorry, wrong order. Pretend I didn't say what I just said. Will to obey first. Yeah, back with me. So, will to obey um, John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And James 1, 22 and 23, But he does, but he be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. So we all need a higher standard. That's something that's just built into us. We all get that. Um, some people pick other things, but if you look around the world, the world's looking for something outside of themselves. Um, and as Christians, our answer is yes, yes we know, let us tell you what it is. Um, this Bible, um, actually interesting story, when I lived in Columbus, I was helping out at the church library, and they had they had the pile of books they were going to discard, because they didn't need them anymore, they had duplicate copies of them, whatever it was, one of them was this Bible. They were going to throw this in the trash. Um, they, the cover had been detached, and I said, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> We're going to throw it away. Well, why? And I get it. I mean, a church library doesn't need you know, a family Bible that's you know, like this. What are you going to do with it? I said, can I have that? <laughs> they said, sure. So I have it now in my house. I had it rebound. Uh, but this is the, the cover of it, and that's Joshua 24, um, 15. Which is, you know, uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So we all have to have a higher standard, and we all have to recognize God sets the standard. You know, when you're when you're teaching your children, they need to understand the standard comes from you. The standard doesn't come from their friends. The standard doesn't come from the culture. It doesn't come from their teachers. It comes from you. You are their higher standard. 
Now, they also need to, as they get older, grow, understand that your standard comes from God and comes from the Bible. That needs to be made very clear to them. This is not, I didn't make this up. These are not just mom and dad's rules. This comes from Scripture. If you don't like it, you gotta take that up with God. You can argue with them as much as you'd like. Um, like how that goes. Um, but they have to understand there's this will to obey. Obedience is critical, um, absolutely critical. And if you happen to have a strong willed child, um, congratulations. Um, because if you get it right, it's fantastic. Strong willed adults who've been directed properly are incredibly successful. And I don't mean just in the world's eyes. They're the ones who lead. Um, now, if you have a strong willed child and you screw it up, you will later have to apologize to the rest of us because those are the hellions. Um, but if you direct them, that's, they don't need to be changed. A strong willed child doesn't need to be changed, it just needs to be directed. Point them in the right direction because a strong willed child, like, like that, the bull in a china shop, and then don't tell me what to do. I will tell you what to do. Um, I have this thing with my kids. I have some strong-willed children. Um, some might say I was strong-willed as a child. Um, <laughs> but as I heard from my mom, from my grandmother, that my father was just like. So it's not my fault. <laughs> so one of the things I do with my kids is if I'm telling them something, they're they have a little bit pushback. I start with which one of us is the dad, and what you will get is the idol. <sighs> which one of us is the dad? Like, no, you have to answer that question. You are okay. So which one of us is in charge, you or me? Which one of us is in charge, you or me? You are, okay. <laughs> so therefore, because I'm in charge, and you recognize that I'm in charge, you have to do what I tell you. And one of the greatest things that ever happened to me was years ago, I was in a different room, and my th three older boys were arguing about something. And one of them popped in with, you're not in charge, dad's in charge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's stuck. So they have to learn obedience. And of course, obedience isn't just, I mean, obedience is a part of all of our lives. I mean, you obey all the time, whether you think about it or not. I mean, unless, unless you literally blow through every stop sign, every red light, and you speed all the time, and never use your turn signal, you're obeying constantly. Fill out your taxes, don't answer that. Um, it, it's just literally all around us. You're obeying authority all the time. It's literally in our, our lives all the time. And the earlier a person learns that, the easier their life gets. You know, you, I can almost guarantee you, if you interviewed the people in prison, that pretty close to 100% of them probably didn't learn their parents were in charge when they were kids. I'm sure there's exceptions, but it's got to be close to 100%. Okay, so let me see how it will work. Ah, okay. A work to do. Back to that. Colossians 3, 22 and 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as to the Lord, and not for men, knowing that through the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Work is not part of the curse, despite how you may feel tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. God made work as part of life. Um, this picture is um, right here. Is my third son being sworn into the United States Navy. So work is always going to be part of our life. It's something that we, even when you're retired, you have a work to do. Now it changes what your work to do is as you go. I mean, when you're a child, a work to do is do what your parents tell you. you know, do your chores, do your schoolwork. You need to get into college, you work to do. Get into your career, there's your work to do. When you retire, you have another work to do. Because, you know, interestingly, retirement is a whole different topic. But in the Bible, 
Does anybody know what the one reference to retirement is in the Bible? That he did rest, but there's actual mention of retirement for human beings. There is. The Levites can retire at 50. That's it. Only mention of it. No mention of retirement. Now, does that mean God says you should never retire? No, it doesn't say that. But what it says, the Bible doesn't say about retirement. So work is part of life. And when you retire, you should do have another work to do. Find out what that is. Find out what God has for you in retirement. It probably will look different than it will look like in your career. But it's something, God has something in mind for you. And so this work to do, it continues through your entire life. Until you die, you have a work to do. <clears throat> And the third one, a woman to love. <coughs> Ephesians 5. <coughs> Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So this starts when they're young, obviously. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen that picture on the left. What? That is my parents on their wedding day. So a few years ago. Um, and the one on the right... Um, that's one of my favorite pictures. That's my wife and our um, now 10-year-old and 8-year-old sons. So when they're younger, obviously, the woman to love is their mom. And so, and as they grow up, you know, they have girlfriends and they get married, but they'll learn. They will learn, your boys will learn how to treat their wives when they're kids. It's not something you can pick things up as you get older, obviously, but that's where they'll learn kind of the basics of how do I treat a woman? That they're going to learn that in their home. And they're going to learn that from you, the dad. You know, the dad's going to teach the boys how you treat women. They're going to see that in their, in their father, how they treat their wives, how they treat their daughters. Um, and if you have daughters, again, they're going to under, the girls are going to know how they expect to be treated by men from you as the dad. So you know, as they get older, this, this progresses. Um, so they're, they're going to look to their dads on how, how to treat women. <clears throat> so the, the book, Mock Raising Monterey Night, has a big deal on ceremonies. And the reason is, is because he kind of started this book with the idea of what happened to our culture? What happened to men? You know, what, what is this, you know, what, what went wrong? You know, how did, how did the... You know, the greatest generation of World War II spawned the late 60s. You know, how, how does that happen? <laughs> you know, where did, where did we go awry in our, in our culture? And one of the things he pointed to was, was these ceremonies. He said, we, we, you know, we have now in our culture, you know, you send your, your son off to college at 18 and you go, go be a man. What does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean to be a man? And I think that he said, you need to have this intentionality that starts so that when you do send your sons off to college or the careers, that you, I know they know what it means to be a man. That doesn't mean they're not going to screw up. That they know what it means to be a man when they go off. When you tell them, be a man, they know what that means because you've taught them the previous 18 years what that means. And he said, back, you know, going back in, in history, there were lots of ceremonies. So like, you know, a knight, for example, that's where he gets this imagery from. A knight never wandered around wondering if he was a knight. Where you do have 25-year-old males going, am I really a man? What does it even mean? There was no confusion with a knight. Are you a knight? Yes. No. How do you know? Well, because I went through a knight ceremony. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Very straightforward. Did you or didn't you? And so he said these ceremonies are a big deal. that He calls it spiking these events. And so um, I kind of created my age framework um, for these ceremonies. Uh, so the first one I do is a page at the age of eight, and that's when they are supposed to have, we talked about the four things a man does, you know, reject passivity, accept responsibility, be courageously expected greater reward. We've gone through that with them. Um, and then they're told, okay, this is, you're starting your journey of man. You know, I now need you to look out for you know, your younger siblings, your younger friends in, in the group. You know, you're kind of taking that first step. And you still want to learn, but you've got that first step, and you have that ceremony. And um, I have a really big sword. Uh, the reason I have a really big sword is because it's cool. 
Um, <laughs> you, know, you can do whatever you want. Um, swords aren't your thing, that's fine. But it's, it's the ceremony that's important. Now, I just like swords. But the, it's the, the gathering of the men together. That's the other part of it. Having other men involved in your kids' lives is crucial. And we have kind of moved away from that. I mean, it's interesting. When I was a kid, if one of my, you know, if there was an adult male in the neighborhood who told me to do something, I would have done it. It doesn't matter if I knew who they were, because that's what you did. I mean, but today, like, if I was walking around and told some eight-year-old what to do and they didn't know me, I don't know what the response would be. Probably, yeah, they might call the cops. Right. I mean, it's, we, we've lost that. Uh, that that influence of other men, and and plus on top of that, you will probably find when your child becomes a teenager, you will miraculously overnight become a moron. It's amazing how it happens. You will become a moron. You know nothing. But your friend, who's also a dad, he's cool. So wouldn't it be great if you had your friend involved in your son's life also, so that they could say some of the things that you said, and your son is processing that going, oh, my dad's an idiot. <laughs> but, you know, Mr. Smith said this, too, and so, I mean, he's cool. <laughs> so my dad must have accidentally got that one right. <laughs> but then, you know, you just have that, that influence of other men who are not the dad, because there's going to be times when the conflict between the the child and the father is going to be such that there's just not going to be any listening going on. Uh, the second one is squire. I do that at 13, and that's when I add the three additional, you know, a will to obey, a work to do, and a will to love. Um, and then let them know, like, you are now in the second phase of learning to be a man. And I need to step up even further. You need to understand these additional principles. And you're, you know, you're getting to the point now where manhood is not that far off. Um, of course, at 13, you think 18 is you know, eons away, but you know, as adults, we know it's not very far off. Um, and the, the third ceremony is the night ceremony when they turn 18. This is the, you know, the conclusion, the culmination of all of the training. Um, I have them go over this. The book has these 10 codes of conduct. I'm going to go over those. There are loyalty, humility, excellence, servant leadership, honesty, integrity, self-discipline, kindness, purity, and personality. So like if, you, if you can send your son off into the world knowing he understood and could practice these 10 things, feel pretty good. You know, and that's, that's the idea behind these ceremonies and this training, is that you're sending them off knowing they know this stuff. They have, they have, it's in them now. Again, it doesn't mean they're not going to screw up or struggle, but at least they have that, that foundation to know this is what it means to be a man. Um, the final one is one I haven't done. Um, that's kind of the oath one where you know they when they get when they get when your son gets married. Um, I haven't had any of those yet because none of my sons are married. Um, so but these ceremonies really spike the these events and they will remember them. Uh, and then when my for me when my boys turn eighteen, I buy them their own sword. And I have um, Hebrews four twelve engraved on the sword with their name and the date of the ceremony. So they now have this sword that they can keep you know, for the rest of their lives. And it's, again, it's just, it's just a reminder to them, you know, when they see that, that you hope they see the sort of like, oh, yeah, okay, I remember how we did this ceremony, we did this, and I remember those things that my dad said, and they really, it really starts to sink in. <clears throat> I have a question. Yes. Um, is this automatic, or do they have to be in agreement with your um, different stages? They have to be in agreement. Okay. So yes, it, this is not automatic. They have to earn this. Okay. Um, fortunately, in our group, we have not had um, uh, 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 instances uh, where there were people who were okay. not allowed to participate. But it's certainly possible. Okay. Um, we have actually we've had the delayed ones. They said, "Mike, he's not ready yet." Like, okay, that's fine. But, and it was funny because the guy came to me. He was all nervous. He's like, I don't think he's ready for the ceremony. What, what should I do? Is it okay if I skip it? He's your son. You should do what's best for him. If you don't think he's ready, then absolutely don't do it. Because if you do it when he isn't ready, you're not sending the right message. And then he hasn't learned those things yet. So yeah, that's a good question. So I just have a couple pictures, um, some of the ceremonies. So um, these things are, I just have some, some quotes here uh, that are just kind of interesting. 
As Boy carries out suggestions more full heartedly and understands their aim, a uh, little boy is the thing God used to make a man. Parents are afraid to put their foot down because the children step on the toes. Um, so, you know, again, the, the top one does not mean that you have to give your child an answer every time they ask you why you told them to do something. Please feel free, whenever you want, to use the thing you hated the most when you were a child, which is because I told you to. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, they, so if your child thinks they're entitled to an explanation, they need to be disabused of that notion very quickly. Sometimes you should explain it to them when you feel it's appropriate, but sometimes you shouldn't. Um, heritage. Uh, this is kind of what I saw. When I was a boy at 14, my father was so ignorant, I could probably stand to have the old man around. When I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> <laughs> Character is largely plot, and the father of the home should be the great source of character and affection. This one, I mean, you have to buy into this. You know, it doesn't matter what you teach your, your kids. If you act like an idiot, you're going to get idiots. And it's just they're going to do what you do. It doesn't matter what you say. Well, that's not as much. Um, there are many ways to measure success, not the least of which is the way your child describes you when talking to a friend. Um, although it is funny because it's six, usually that's going to be, my dad can beat up your dad. <laughs> um, when you teach your son, you teach your son's son. Um, this one is huge. If you, have, if you have a heritage going back generations of Christian upbringing, you're fortunate. Not everybody has that. But the great thing is, it can start with you. If you have no heritage going back of Christian upbringing, start now. Because three generations from now, you'll have three generations of Christian upbringing. Time. And that's, it, it's, it really is hard to explain. You know, when I come in from work, my kitchen's flooded with very small children. And who all want to do stuff all the time. Um, it can be a little wearying at times, but, you know, that's what they, that's what they want. Bring up a child the way you should go travel that way yourself once in a while. <laughs> That's the, they're going to do what you do. Um, don't worry that children never listen to you. Worry that they're always watching you. Again, uh, parents often talk about the younger generations that they didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> so, yeah, when you see a generation, what's wrong with that generation? <laughs> mm, well, <laughs> you're the ones that spawned them. The true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. That's again a good one to teach the boy about the leading courageous. Why did they do this? Why are they leading? They're leading because of what's behind them. Um, reinforce it. Intended to fight fire with fire, remember the fire department usually uses water. <clears throat> Never too old to learn something stupid. Uh, men occasionally stumble over the truth, most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as nothing ever happened. <laughs> this is the reinforcement part. You have to over and over and over again. Um, this is just, I acknowledge as knowing tomatoes are fruit, wisdom is not putting in a fruit salad. Um, the difference between knowing something and being wise. This is just fun. Um, boys are boys. Uh, my father used to play with my brother, being in the yard, my mother would come out and say, you're teaching up, you're tearing up the grass. We're not raising grass, we're raising boys. <laughs> uh, my two older boys were very little. My wife came to the house and said, can you come see something? I said, sure. So I got outside, she walks up, she goes, is that normal? <laughs> yep. She said, okay. My sisters and I wouldn't have done that. I said, I know you were girls, because we had a playhouse in our backyard. Guess what my boys were doing with it? Jumping off the roof. <laughs> If Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer are alive today, we'd say they had ADD or a conduct disorder. They are who they are, and we need to love them for who they are. Let's not try to rewire them. This is what the public schools are doing. The public schools are trying to teach your boys not to be boys. Not all, some of them are better than others. Um, some, say parents say, some parents say it's toy guns that make boys warlike. We give a boy a rubber duck, and he will seize his neck with the butt of a pistol and shout, bang. <laughs> Six year old son. We don't play with them on pretend with guns. Okay, so these are just some fun pictures. That's my now 18-year-old, um, and he wanted to see how high he did jump. He's like 20 feet off the, off, off the water, but he ripped that branch off. He was very proud of himself. And somebody said, 
we were doing this, we walked by. Isn't that dangerous? <laughs> yes. <It's> yeah. nice. <laughs> Sometimes you need to have guns. Sometimes you need to breathe fire. Sometimes you need to throw your sister in the air. This the middle, the middle there, that's my five-year-old daughter being thrown by my 18-year-old son and my 21-year-old son. They're playing catch hot potato with her. <laughs> Five rocks. Um, this was my, he's now 10. Um, and he was watching them jump into the water. He gave me that look. This is my now eight-year-old son, Joshua. And <laughs> Well, this is my caption of that photograph. I have five older brothers. <laughs> because shortly after this picture was taken, my fifth son, who was less than two at the time, walked up to him, and poked him in the eye. <laughs> All right, so that is the raising of my early night. Any questions, comments? As an expert, I just have one comment. I, I, with regard to uh, the decision you made for your job, right? So you guys decided to homeschool. We decided the public school. Full disclosure, I'm a public school teacher. And I see it every day because I'm a middle school homeschool teacher. So the war on boys, and I guess it last week, is very real. But there will always be a war on boys, whether they're homeschool, public school, whatever. And then Making a big deal out of your, your boy using toy guns, that's a child play, a child play, compared to what our boys are up against. But the question is that you have to ask yourself, you're making that decision, is how much do you want them to engage, right, with the culture? Or how much do you have to instill in that? So we as a family have decided our kids are going to be in public schools, we're not going to do Christian school. Because, and I, I, I'm not going to criticize anybody's decision to homeschool, to do Christian school, or whatever. You have to make that decision for yourself. But I think the other side of that argument is they can't hide from the world. And also, God is going to use my son to be courageous in public schools. And I have to be ready to equip him. So it's an added challenge, you know? And to, it, no matter where God puts your family, whether it's it puts your boy, whether it's public school, home school, Christian school, whatever, they're going to encounter some crazy stuff. And so it's a matter of praying that God helps you make that decision wisely. Where does he want, what does he want for your family? Yeah, and that's a, that's a great point, and it's kid by kid. Right. So I mean, we have homeschooled our kids, public school our kids, and Christian school our kids, depending on which one it was. So my third son, the one going into the Navy, we had him in public high school. Because we, for him, it's the best thing. So yeah, you, it has to be a decision for each kid. What's the best thing for them? You're right. Yes. I would just add to that that what an opportunity we have as a church. Oh, come on, I have to the uh, To uh, love on boys here in this place, and I can say that our experience, our kids, our boys are 25 and 24, and. Um, you know, whether it was Joe Williams or Bob Thompson or um, Marilyn Neese, just loving them the way they are, treating them, you know, the way God sees them, it's huge. So I think we all have the opportunity to do that. How do you handle dating? I have four daughters. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, dating is. You know, again, it's going to be kid by kid. I think you should have an age, though, um, and you should stick to it. So whatever you pick, you need to make sure that you're going to be okay with the tears. <laughs> when they want to date, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when they want to date, that's where you're ready. Um, but and you need to talk to them about it beforehand. It, this has got to be a conversation as they get older to start talking about what dating means. You know, when they're going to be allowed to do it, why you're putting that. They are around, and, under, and they need to understand that the reason you put those rules around them is for their protection. You know, they need to understand that that, they're, that you're you're trying to teach them these values so that when they grow up, they're going to be you know, they're going to you know, for your daughters to pick the right man because this is going to be the one who's going to be the father of their children. You, know, you got to choose carefully, and you need to be highly involved. I mean, it's my third son um, 
his, he's actually the only one of our boys who's dated. Um, and so there's been a couple of girls who dated that father didn't even meet him. Like, what is that? You know, I, I had a meeting with the girls. You know, because we wanted to, I wanted to go over things and talk about things. I think it's really critical to be heavily involved in that process. So kind of related to that, and I have a feeling you'll answer this with it's kid by kid. But you know, how how did you or when did you start to have discussions more specific to purity with your sons, particularly related to pornography, um, but also related to how you treat women? I, I assume that's kind of where you start. Uh, yeah, women, and then the other stuff has to be addressed at some point sooner now than it used to be. Yeah, so the way, yeah, the, the treating women part starts really young. Um, the purity thing, so what I've done with my kids is when they're 13 years old, um, I take them, just the two of us, on a trip. So my oldest son went to, to Disneyland, my second son went to Mammoth Cave, my third son, shockingly, toured in military museums, um, and my fourth son went to Universal Studios. So part of that is spending time with them, kind of that ceremony thing, but we also went through um, folks and families um, uh, what's it called? Passport purity, and that has all the information on that to go over all this because it's you know it's uncomfortable, <laughs> but it's critical. We've got to talk about it. And, you know, if, if you're if you're not having a conversation with your child because you feel uncomfortable, you're not helping. You're really not. So uh, for us, it's 13, but some of those conversations do have to be earlier than that, you know, especially for not. We're going to have to cut the last non question for just uh, five minutes until the service starts. So thanks a lot, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, and let's pray my prayer. Father, we thank you for this time and together. Thank you for the experiences that Dan has told us about. We ask that each of us will learn what we should do with our kids and our grandkids. And um, we ask that we will be able to uh, communicate to them and to others uh, the message that your word has on this important subject. Now um, we ask that you would be with us as we worship you in the worship service. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And as a final note, thank you for being a light in public schools. Yes. We need way more Christian teachers in public schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.